Hello and welcome everyone. We are happy to be back with you today. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Dr. Lauren Edgar and I am the Associate Director of Clinical Affairs and Education at the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. I am really, really happy to have some of our wonderful experts within the amyloidosis community, Dr. Sandy Wong and Nancy Wong, present to you today. Dr. Sandy Wong is the Associate Clinical Professor, Division Hematological, Hematology and Oncology, and the Director of Amyloidosis Program and the, at the University of California at San Francisco Medical Center. She is a plasma cell doctor, and her focus, or research specifically, focuses on plasma cell diseases, and more so, subspecialties include CAR T cell therapies, T cell engagers, and novel agents. Nancy, so happy to have you with us. Nancy is a nurse practitioner also with the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of California San Francisco Medical Center. And San, excuse me, Nancy particularly focuses on hematology. She specializes in bone marrow transplant and cellular therapy departments with a focus in managing patients with multiple myeloma and amyloidosis. So happy to have you both with us today. Now, while most of you may be familiar with our organization, ARC's mission is to improve and extend the lives of those with amyloidosis. ARC is committed to collaborative efforts that accelerate the pace of discovery, expand patient access to the most effective care, and improve short and long-term outcomes. Now, it's important that I mention that working with partners in industry, government, and academia, ARC looks to spark innovation and bring promising treatments from labs to clinics. ARC's outreach and education inform and empower patients, families, caregivers, physicians, and researchers. We pride ourselves in being a science-based patient organization, working to de-risk drug development by strategically implementing programs, which we believe are critical to better care for patients and facilitate and accelerate drug development in these rare diseases. It's important that I mention that our focuses really seek to improve the speed and accuracy of diagnoses, increase our understanding of genetics, biology, and natural history of amyloidosis, to identify new treatments. We also look to accelerate regulatory approval and reimbursement of effective treatments for patients. Lastly, our focus is to enhance care and quality of life of patients and caregivers throughout their amyloidosis journey. We here at ARC would like to send a special thank you to the organizations mentioned on this slide that sponsor this program. If you have any questions today, hold them until after the presentation, if you please. And once we are ready, you will hear me announce that you will have the opportunity to type in your questions in the Q&A box, box on your Zoom control panel. Again, please note that questions will be entertained at the close of the speaker's presentation. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Wong. Thank you again, ladies. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Let me go ahead and just share my screen. Switch the screens. Okay. All right, very good. First of all, thank you so much uh, uh, to ARC um, and the organizers for inviting us to speak with all of you today. Um, today, we're going to talk about autologous stem cell transplant uh, in the systemic light chain amyloidosis. Here are our disclosures. So, first, we're going to go over the overview of the biology of this disease, and then we're, we're going to um, after doing that, we can have a foundation for understanding stem cell transplant as a treatment for this disease. 
Then we'll move into an overview of the stem cell transplant process. I will then turn it over to Nancy, my co-presenter, who will go over the pre-transplant evaluation and preparation. Then I will uh, come back and talk about the hospital course and side effects of stem cell transplant. And then I'll turn it back to Nancy for, for post-transplant care. Um, Nancy has been my nurse practitioner uh, for the past, I think, four years. And uh, she is really uh, the amyloidosis uh, nurse practitioner um, uh, in our med center. And I'm, I'm so excited to present uh, this information with her today. Okay, so what is systemic AL and how does this disease work? Systemic AL is really a protein deposition disease as well as a cancer, but this is not like you know, typical cancers that we think about like breast cancer and lung cancer where the cancer cells form masses or nodules and they press on other organs uh, causing disease. In systemic AL, the amount of abnormal cells, the cancer cells are actually low in nature However, it is the secreted product of these abnormal cells that are light chains, i.e. light chains, that then fold and then deposit in the organs, causing the organ to uh, malfunction. So the common uh, organs affected with this disease include the heart and the kidneys. In the heart, it can cause, the heart is a pump, um, and it, when it is a disease with amyloidosis, it can cause heart failure. And when the heart uh, fails as a pump, then patients you can have um, lower extremity edema, and they can have engorgement of their neck veins, as you can see on the bottom uh, two pictures. And in some patients, uh, this could also cause a, an abnormal heart rhythm as well. In the kidneys, early kidney damage shows up as a protein in the urine, and the patients may see this as foamy urine in the toilet after they urinate. And if the disease is left unchecked, this can cause kidney failure and eventually dialysis. There are other organs that may be involved in this disease, such as the gut, uh, the nervous system, uh, the soft tissue deposition. On, on the right here, you can see that this patient has deposition into the tongue, causing, causing enlargement of the tongue. And when the tongue enlarges, the tongue presses up against the teeth, uh, which then leaves all these indentations uh, around the edge of the tongue. Um, patients could also have bleeding disorders, uh, issues with, uh, with, with clotting. And in some patients, there could be vascular deposition, basically deposition into these small uh, blood vessels. And this may manifest as uh, bruising around the eyes. And if it's pretty severe, it could be rather dramatic. And uh, that sometimes we, we nickname that phenomenon as quote unquote raccoon eyes. So this is the way that this disease works. And I always explain it to my, to my patients as, as a factory. The, those abnormal cells oftentimes are abnormal plasma cells. Um, there are a small percentage of patients where the underlying uh, cancer is a lymphoma, but a great majority of patients, the underlying culprit cells are abnormal or cancerous plasma cells. These cells, they sit in the marrow and they act like a toxic factory where they produce light chains, in the bloodstream, you can measure them in the bloodstream. They misfold and then they deposit in the organs as represented here as, as the heart and, and uh, the tree as the heart and, and, uh, and the, uh, the river as the kidney. So essentially it's a, essentially a polluting factory in your body um, that is essentially polluting the body and then uh, leading the body to not function the way it should. The goals for treatment of this disease is to improve the quality of a patient's life and, and improve the quantity of life. And we do that by shutting down quickly and completely the, the toxic factory that is making these toxic light chains. And once that factory is shut down or shut off, once that production of uh, amyloid forming light chains is shut down or shut off, the amyloid can come out of the heart, it can come out of the kidneys, as long as the, the, the amyloid has not caused uh, uh, irreversible harm in these organs. And, and once the amyloid comes out of these uh, organs, that can lead to an organ uh, improvement. And that's what we strive to, to do, to try to shut down this factory quickly so that then the body hopefully can then remove the amyloid from these organs. So how does stem cell transplant fit into all this? Well, stem cell transplant belongs to a modality of treatment that we use to shut down that factory. And this is different uh, from 
anti-amyloid fibro agents, which are in clinical trials right now that some of our viewers might have learned about, um, where the focus is really at accelerating removal of amyloid from the heart, from the, the kidneys. And so this is really focused on shutting down the factory. And if you look over time, back in the 1970s, Melphalan, uh, so this is a derivative of mustard gas, melphalan. Melphalan given uh, in low doses in pill form plus steroids, which is prednisone back in the 1970s, was so really the first effective treatment for this disease. But as you can see here, in terms of hematologic response, hematologic response is our fancy way of saying how uh, how shut down that factory is, um, was only 28%, and the organ response was 20 to 30%. So even though you see people get better, but you know these numbers uh, could be better. You know we could we, we hope to improve improve the odds a patient will have an organ response. Then in the 19 uh, late 1990s I came along, and the Boston University group, uh, led by uh, Dr. Comenzo and his colleagues, Dr. Comenzo was a former colleague and a uh, is a is a colleague and a former mentor of mine. Um, he at the BU uh, group the BU group really pioneered stem cell transplant uh, in the United States, and the papers and the papers original papers that came out around this time. And the reason why this was so uh, practice changing for this field was that you can see that the hematologic response was 62% and the organ response was also in the in the 60th percentile, which is a very large improvement compared to the oral met, uh, met, uh, melphalan and prednisone that people previously received. However, only certain patients are strong enough to get through a stem cell transplant. And in those patients, um, melphalan and prednisone, and then eventually melphalan and dexamethasone were still the treatments being used at that time. And then over time, there were other drugs that were being studied. I would say that the, the next uh, you know, big advancement would be um, Cyborg-D. Cy, uh, Cyborg-D stands for cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, dexamethasone. This is a cocktail of three drugs that uh, are uh, used in patients that uh, were transplant ineligible. And you can see that in terms of hematologic response, you see a response rate of 62%, which is really exciting to see that in a, in a non um, some sort of transplant uh, treated population. However, the organ response was not um, was not that high. Um, as you can see here, renal cardiac response was was really you know at very low rates. And I think you know the latest and, and uh, breakthrough for the treatment of the disease, the, this disease uh, was using. Daratumumab. So as of 2021, daratumumab in combination with Cyber-D was FDA approved for the treatment of newly diagnosed AL patients. And this was really studied in patients who were, um, uh, for which uh, transplant was not planned. So it's not that, not that they were ineligible for some cell transplant, um, but it's really um, uh, some cell transplant uh, was not planned. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the another drug that's currently being studied for AL patients is venetoclax for patients with translocation 1114. So that's why stem cell transplant you know, um, has been a very big deal, has really changed the way we, we treat this disease because we know that patients are going to have a really high organ response. Now, how, how, how is this treatment modality, uh, uh, how does this really compare with uh, uh, DARA-based treatment? So let's talk about the Andromeda trial. The, the Andromeda trial is the phase three trial that led to the approval of DARA cyber D uh, in patients with newly diagnosed AL. And this is a phase three trial where patients are randomized to DARA cyber D versus cyber D. And you can see here in terms of the response rate, uh, at a median follow-up of 26 months, a VGPR, which is a very good partial response, or better, and, and this is, you know, these are the response rates that are considered acceptable, or response, um, uh, uh, this is the depth of response that is considered acceptable, VGPR and CR, which is complete response, was 79%, which is really, you know, great. Um, and, and compared to the CyberD arm, you can see that this is a uh, improvement over the control arm, which is the cyber D arm. Now, in terms of the organs, you can see that at six months, the cardiac response with the DARA cyber D arm was 42% compared to 22%. And that percentage goes up actually at the 18 month mark where it goes up from 42 to 53%. So this is really exciting. And you can see the same thing being replicated in patients with uh, renal amyloidosis. 
And as a result, this, you know, this is really what we do now for newly diagnosed uh, patients with AL. Now, what about how does this compare with stem cell transplant? Well, there is no trial that compares these treatment modalities head to head yet. However, we can derive some uh, clues from the uh, uh, Boston University retrospective study. They basically looked at their experience for patients that went uh, straight to stem cell transplant. And if you can see here, those who achieved a VGPR or better was actually quite comparable um, around uh, 70, 74%. And at six months, renal response was 52%, cardio response was 42%. So also, you know, very comparable to what you're seeing uh, with DARA CyberD. These are obviously cross, you know, uh, study comparisons. So we have to take it with a grain of salt, but this is what we have so far. And a lot of patients ask me, well, with a stem cell transplant, like if I do this, how long does it take for, for this disease to relapse? And it's anywhere from two to two to four years, depending on uh, which study you're looking at. Now, what about a, you know, what about the DARA CYBRD study? What about the Andromeda study? At what point did patients relapse? We actually don't have that data yet because uh, the long-term readout for that data has not matured. So we're still awaiting those types of results. So. Um, so who goes to stem cell transplant? Well, you do have to be transplant eligible, and we're going to talk about what that means later. Um, you have to be strong enough to get through a stem cell transplant. So what do, you do, what do we do for patients who are strong enough to get through a stem cell transplant? What we start out with, with is DARA CYBRD, and then this is where the gray area is and where, uh, and I think a lot needs to be learned about about you know, patients that, uh, what to do with stem cell transplant after this. In the Andromeda trial, patients did not get transplanted, right? Um, so so uh, should patients, but there are some centers that are doing stem cell transplant after patients get DARA-CYBRD. Is that the right thing to do? Um, I think that's still debated as of right now. However, I think there are some folks that I think you know, without a doubt, stem cell transplant should be considered. Um, so I would say, you know, for your individual case, make sure you discuss with your AMLA doctor what the right approach would be for you, because I, there is some nuance to the decision making here. But there are some general rules that I think uh, are, are common to all, all transplant centers. If patients after DARA CyberD achieved less than a VGPR, so we're talking about people who only had a partial response or who had no response, obviously those have progressed. Those patients, I think, should really be considered for a stem cell transplant. Now, what about patients who have a VGPR or, or a CR? I think that's where the gray area uh, is. Um, at UCSF, what we do is um, we, after getting the, the patient started on DARA CyberD, you will know very quickly in the first month or so whether or not a patient achieves a VGPR or better. In fact, it only takes two weeks median for someone to achieve a VGPR or better in the Andromeda trial. And so looking at the response to therapy, that's when I would figure out you know, whether or not we should talk about stem cell transplant. And then if they don't, have, if they have an inadequate response to DARA CYBRD, then I would look to see if they have a translocation 1114. And if they do, I actually would try venetoclax before moving on to a stem cell transplant. Again, you will know what the res results will be very relatively quickly. So that is what we do at UCSF. However, that may uh, differ from center to center. If patients do not have a translocation 1114 um, and they have an insufficient response to DARA CYBRD, those patients, I think definitely um, should move on to a, a stem cell transplant. So what is a stem cell transplant? Um, first of all, we have to understand what stem cells are. Stem cells are C cells that live in the marrow and they give rise to white cells that fight infections red cells that carry oxygen, and platelets that help a patient stop bleeding. It used to be called bone marrow uh, transplant, but, but no longer. Now we call it a stem cell transplant. We don't call it bone marrow transplant anymore because in the past, we used to stick a needle directly into the bone to remove the stem cells, but luckily we don't need to do that anymore. And there are medicines that we can use to get the stem cells out. But, but so that is what stem cells are. Okay, so how does this you know, figure out into the whole transplant process? Well. We talked about melphalan, you know, taking melphalan by pills. Remember back in the 1970s, I, I showed you that back then, uh, melphalan at low doses by pill form was effective. Well, actually, melphalan at high doses, given IV, is very effective against plasma cells. However, it is toxic to the bone marrow, the hair follicles, and the gut. So just given, giving high-dose melphalan without any stem cell transplant 
will wipe away the plasma cells, but it will prevent the bone marrow from recovering. And obviously that would be unacceptable. And as a result, we collect the patient's stem cells ahead of time before giving the IV melphalan in order to use them later to rescue the patients from marrow toxicity. However, this is a treatment modality that is you know, really for patients who are strong enough to get through a stem cell transplant. And unfortunately, patients with systemic AL are really diagnosed late in their disease. And as a result, many of them are actually not eligible for a stem cell transplant. Only 25% of patients who are newly diagnosed are actually eligible for a stem cell transplant. How do we uh, determine transplant eligibility? It does vary center by center. So there are some differences, but generally speaking, there are certain rules that, that we live by. Those with cardiac stage B disease generally are not offered a stem cell transplant. This are the cardiac stage three uh, patients are those who are, have a very advanced cardiac disease. And we don't transplant those patients because the patients are usually too, too sick to get a stem cell transplant. Now, patients with cardiac stage 3A disease at UCSF, at least certain patients with cardiac stage 3A disease are allowed. Um, other patients that are not transplant eligible include those with liver failure or kidney function, a severe bleeding disorder, patients who are frail, and patients who have very low blood pressure. So that's why before stem cell transplant, we really need to do testing to establish the eligibility and to prepare the patient for transplant. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nancy. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for the intro. And thank you, Dr. Wong, for the overview of AL amyloidosis and transplant. Now I will go over um, the workup prior to the transplant and how patients can prepare for their transplant. So Dr. Wong, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. In preparing for the stem cell transplant, um, first of all, the discussion needs to happen. Is an autologous stem cell transplant the right approach to your um, treatment of AO? And once that's decided, um, you will meet with a transplant coordinator. This person will basically be your go-to person in preparing for the transplant. Uh, they will help guide you through the steps and organize any workup that needs to be done. And uh, part of your transplant team may also involve a nurse, um, uh, advanced practice provider, like a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, and then um, a, a social worker. Uh, this is the minimum. There could be other um, parties involved um, as part of the um, transplant team. Other resources um, that your transplant center um, can recommend or offer um, maybe some additional reading materials. Um, and at our center, we provide um, patients with a video to watch to really fully understand uh, the transplant process. Um, you will be asked to identify a primary caregiver um, and um, or caregivers, um, if that's what it takes. Um, and this person will be um, an important person uh, when you go home after your transplant. Um, this person should be staying with you um, at your home to, to take care of you um, during a certain period of time post-transplant. Uh, this could be a family member or a friend. Uh, and depending on the transplant center, there, uh, will, there can be some other additional resources um, such as a spiritual leader, um, any support groups, a chaplain, it just depends on the needs. Um, and you can also um, consider um, other resources like the ARC, um, the Multiple Myeloma Research uh, Foundation. And most importantly, when it comes to transplant prep, um, it's to consider um, things that will help improve physical and or maintain um, mental health. And um, first is trying to maintain a healthy diet. So this can be you know, consider like a heart healthy diet, low in sodium, lean proteins, and to try your best to maintain your weight. Um, also trying to stay mentally and physically active as best as you can. Um, 
And this is probably not the best time to make any dramatic dietary changes. Um, other things you can consider is joining a support group, asking for a referral um, to uh, your, your hospital symptom management group, connecting with a the therapist. Um, these can all be very helpful in terms of managing mental stressors. Um, and then try to stay active as best as you can, uh, just depending on exercise tolerance. And this could just be walking a few blocks every day. Uh, as part of your transplant team, I mentioned um, the social worker uh, who can be very helpful in terms of uh, figuring out caregiving issues, any financial gaps, filling out disability forms, um, advanced directives, um, uh, offering any patient support they can recommend, and then um, discuss housing and any psychological needs. Uh, and then Dr. Wang, I think the next slide. Okay, uh, so in terms of transplant workup, uh, this can vary uh, depending on the transplant center, but uh, will likely consist of baseline lab work, urine tests, um, and also including some transplant specific lab work. Uh, this is where the transplant coordinator um, becomes um, very helpful in terms of setting up all these various tests. Included in the workup uh, is uh, an EKG, an echocardiogram. This is to get a good sense of the, um, your baseline heart health, and then a pulmonary function test uh, for baseline lung function. A bone marrow biopsy often is done prior to the transplant to reassess the um, disease status. And then a current dental exam to ensure that um, your dentition is in good health uh, to help minimize any risk of infections and complications. And then the next slide, Dr. Wong. In preparing for the um, hospitalization itself, um, consider bringing some items from home um, that can be you know, considered personal items for you, things that um, make you feel more comfortable. Um, it could be you know, um, a, a pillow, blanket, uh, clothing that's um, loose and comfortable. Um, so just basically anything that um, allows you to feel a little piece of home. Um, and then other things to consider, you know, entertainment in terms of your favorite books, uh, your laptop, uh, crossword puzzles, anything that really um, helps you um, kind of stay mentally active uh, just because cable TV can only go so long. Um, you'll be at the hospital for a good two weeks um, plus, or plus a few days here and there. And so it's important that you bring enough to keep yourself um, pretty much um, sane in the hospital setting. And other things to consider um, with the high dose chemo that you receive prior to the transplant or the stem cell infusion, it will cause hair loss like Dr. Wong mentioned. And so um, some considerations could be um, cutting your hair short if, if that's what you prefer or bringing along with you a wig or a hat. Um, and things you should definitely avoid bringing, uh, bringing to the hospital would be valuable such as cash, um, jewelry, and in terms of live, live plants, um, we wanna avoid um, bringing in any potential um, bacteria or, or fungus. And so um, live plants like flowers uh, or plants is prohibited. Um, let your visitors know this as well um, when they visit to uh, not bring flowers. And then in terms of body products, um, anything that's too fragrant can be considered an irritant um, for you and for the, the staff members. Lastly, uh, understand the um, transplant center's visitor policy and um, nowadays also the COVID policy. And um, Dr. Wong, the next slide. Um, so it's back to you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, now I'm just gonna give a quick overview in terms of you know what happens in the hospital. So I would caveat this by saying that um, there are some transplant centers 
that do uh, outpatient stem cell transplants for amyloidosis patients. There are some that have a hybrid model. At UCSF, we do all of our stem cell transplants for AL uh, actually in the hospital. And I'm, we're going to go over why, because you're going to see there are these side effects that we want to catch and treat the patient promptly if it comes up. Um, so in our, at our SAM center, we do all stem cell transplants uh, in the hospital. We do uh, we offer outpatient transplant really only for patients with myeloma, um, with myeloma without amyloidosis, of course. Okay, so what happens first? First, we have to mobilize the stem cells. Um, and we talked about earlier that in the old days, we used to use a needle to take the stem cells out. Luckily, we don't do that anymore. We use these drugs, um, uh, Zarcio or Mozobo, they go by multiple names, where essentially these are medicines to lure the stem cells to come out the marrow and into the blood where we can actually collect them. And uh, these uh, drugs are given uh, over multiple days and uh, in order to really kind of uh, you know, uh, rev up the marrow to get them, lure them out into the, into the blood. As a result, because the marrow is in the bone, the uh, patients very commonly with Zarcio experience bone pain, um, but that can be treated with Claritin and Tylenol very effectively. Um, if Zarcio by itself is unable to yield, uh, to, to move enough the stem cells into the blood, we give a second drug called Mozobo, and Mozobo can cause some diarrhea, usually mild and treated but with Imodium. And um, during this process where you're getting these uh, shots and, and getting the um, stem cells to come out into the marrow, specifically for amyloidosis patients, the additional side effects that we watch for is the uh, rare side effect of experiencing rupture of the spleen. And that is usually a very sharp pain um, on the left side of, of the abdomen. Um, patients during this time may also experience shortness of breath, uh, worsened leg swelling, and low blood pressure. And for us, you know, for patients uh, with amyloidosis, we even do this portion of the, um, of the process in the hospital. There are some select patients I would feel comfortable doing a mobilization as an outpatient, but most of our patients are actually in the hospital during this time as well. Now, um, once the stem cells are at sufficient numbers in the, uh, in the blood, we uh, put a catheter in your neck, it's called Quinton catheter. This is a high flow catheter. And then we connect this catheter to the machine. You see on the right-hand side, this is uh, one of our uh, apheresis machines. This machine will take out the blood, spin out the stem cells, and put, put the rest of the blood back into the patient. And then the stem cells are then collected in a bag. This occurs over the course of usually a day. It's not painful. If anything, it's boring. <laughs> and so I always tell patients, you bring a book or, um, or an iPad to keep yourself occupied. A lot of patients just a nap during this process. Um, and after this process is done, the catheter is removed. While the patient is on the apheresis machine, some side effects that are noted may be, like I said, fatigue. Um, and because of the volume shifts, that can precipitate shortness of breath, low blood pressure, or worsened uh, swelling in AL patients specifically. And some patients have, have low calcium because of the, um, the, the blood thinner that we use to keep the tubes um, non-clotted. And if you, and we'll be checking out that level, if some patients may need um, some calcium repletion, I would say very rarely, especially for amyloidosis patients that collect only, only in the course of a day. Okay, in terms of the stem cells, now, now that the stem cells are, are there, they are then uh, uh, frozen away. And in the meantime, um, then uh, uh, patients will then get the high dose uh, uh, melphalan. And the day that the patient uh, get the high dose of melphalan is called day minus two. The next day is a day of rest, that's day minus one. And then the day after that, which is day zero, that's when the stem cells are wheeled uh, to the bedside and they're thawed at the bedside. And then they are hung on an IV pole and jerked back into the patient as if it was a, as a blood transfusion. And then the stem cells will enter the bloodstream. They know to go back uh, to the marrow to reestablish themselves. And then uh, the, uh, the patient is monitored for side effects. I know I'm gonna go through the schedule in the next slide, but generally speaking, what, what we're looking for is that the blood counts uh, i.e. the white cells, the red cells, and platelets will decrease, and then they will get better. And the white count uh, will go all the way down to 
to zero. So don't be alarmed if you see that occur. And then the subsequently, after the counts are low for a few days, then the white count will start to recover. And usually the white count is normal by day plus 14. The patient is usually discharged at that time. And, and then and the patient is then I could go home and then follow up in clinic. This is a sample inpatient transplant calendar, focusing your attention on day plus one to day, day plus three. Usually during this time, the side effects are mild. Day four to day six, that's when the uh, symptoms are moderate. And day seven to 10, this is when the patient is without an immune system for this period of time. And this is when the patient is most vulnerable and when the uh, side effects peak. And then after this part, the white count starts coming back up and then the symptoms will start to also ease. And usually patients can go home by day plus 14. In terms of social distancing, we ask that uh, the patients, when they go home, they socially distance. Um, and that basically means that they that they sh patients should not be going to the grocery market, should not be going to the post office. And the reason is we, we really don't want the patient to be encountering any new germs. They can get them sick. They should come back to clinic uh, once a week uh, for the next month and as or is needed for these two, three weeks during recovery. Okay. Side effects of stem cell transplant, we talked about a low immune system. When the white count is zero, preventative antibiotics will be given. And if the patient has a fever through those preventative antibiotics, IV antibiotics will be given. Um, patients may have decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea. Um, and in patients with AL specifically, we need to monitor for bleeding from the gut. And sometimes the platelets will have to be maintained at higher levels in order to prevent bleeding. Um, patients uh, can also, specifically for AL patients, may have cardiac side effects. So patients with AL amyloidosis specifically need cardiac monitoring during the entire hospitalization. And that is because they can develop abnormal heart rhythms. So we want to be uh, very vigilant for that. Um, as a result, electrolytes must be maintained aggressively to prevent the development of heart of normal heart rhythms. Um, patients may also experience volume overload, so we have to really be careful about how much fluids we're putting in a patient and how much fluids are exiting the patients, and patients are also weighed daily. Also, um, the other things that to note, this is uh, there is a mortality risk associated with stem cell transplant. Um, around 3% in the first 100 days and mostly due to uh, infection. So this is, that's why we're very vigilant when it comes to infection. And there is, I'll be a small there, but there is a present risk of a 25 years risk of developing um, uh, MDS, AML, this is uh, essentially leukemia. So there are secondary malignancies that we watch for long-term for patients that had, have undergone a stem cell transplant. The criteria for discharge, I uh, kind of alluded to it a little bit. There gotta be a um, improvement in white cell counts. Um, they, the transfusion needs must be infrequent. Nausea, diarrhea have to be well managed so that the patient can eat and drink without the assistance of IV fluids and can take uh, uh, the, their medications. And obviously any infection, if it occurs, must be controlled uh, without further fevers. Okay, I'm going to turn it back to Nancy for post-transplant care. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so now I'll go over the recovery stage. Uh, this is when counts are adequately recovered and um, patients can now return home. Um, oftentimes, you know, this is a time when patients can be very eager to go home. They've been in the hospital for a good two weeks. But at the same time, there is a lot of anxiety around um, surrounding going home um, because you you go from having a nurse um, on standby 24 seven and then now um, you won't have that that service available. Um, just know that uh, the care does not stop when you leave the hospital, uh, that it continues into the clinic. And then keep in mind that your caregiver um, uh, was given a list of responsibilities and that they are there to help. Um, your transplant team is really just a phone call away. So you're never um, you know, alone. And uh, you, you will be seen um, in the clinic uh, pretty frequently at first, uh, likely weekly uh, for two to three weeks um, after returning home. Um, and then really, uh, I can't stress this enough, um, it's really to set realistic expectations. 
this is the time of recovery, uh, healing, and the focus should really be on resting and healing. Uh, and, and this is not the time to, you know, get all your household chores done, to run errands. Um, and another thing that people don't um, think about is this is a great time to reconnect uh, with the support group that um, you may have uh, started during the um, pre-transplant phase and then um, reconnecting with the therapist. Um, and all this should initially be done virtually. And next slide, please. And really, if something doesn't seem right, um, make the phone call to the clinic and ask. Here are some of the reasons that you should definitely call the clinic. Um, any infection symptoms and fevers, uncontrolled nausea, diarrhea, uh, any bleeding or bruising, and just any other symptoms um, that's out of the ordinary. Your transplant team's nurse is an expert at triaging uh, symptoms and recognizing any symptoms that might require immediate attention versus side effects that um, can be managed at home. So don't be afraid to call and ask. Next slide, please. Um, and I was trying to be creative here, but here are some of the things um, that you should consider uh, avoiding. Uh, so Advil, Aleve, and aspirin are all known to um, have blood thinning uh, properties or, or uh, increased bleeding risk. And especially in the post-transplant setting when platelets can be lower than normal, uh, these are drugs to avoid. Uh, and foods are undercooked, raw, um, or, or cooked to medium. Those are not safe temperatures and should be avoided. And then of course, um, any persons with uh, potential infection, um, you should avoid for the time being. And then next slide, please. During uh, the recovery phase, it is um, very common to experience some degree of fatigue and tiredness, and it is absolutely normal to take breaks and take a rest. It gets better every week, but it can um, seem like a slow, slow progress. Um, you will notice that um, certain types of foods or quantities of food may cause some nausea and diarrhea. And that's because with the high dose chemo, the gut um, is affected and it takes time to heal. So at that time, uh, it may be good to consider eating uh, small and frequent meals or um, foods that are uh, less greasy or acidic. The most important thing you can do for yourself is to um, hydrate well. So aim for two liters of fluids a day. Uh, ca caffeinated drinks are okay in moderation um, if it gets you through the day, but it is not counted in those two liters a day. And uh, in terms of driving, there uh, usually will be restrictions um, in terms of no driving for the first 30 days post-transplant date. Um, and so this is the responsibility of the caregiver um, or if um, all you have is a Uber driver, uh, that, that's fine too. But um, you will not be driving for those first 30 days. And like I said before, clinic visits are pretty frequent um, in the beginning, and then it starts um, getting less frequent from there. Uh, during these visits, the blood work will be checked uh, and, and carefully monitored on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because of potential needs for transfusions. So I usually tell patients to plan for a full day in the clinic to bring snacks, bring entertainment, uh, bring a lunch. And after the blood work comes back, then uh, we'll be able to tell if a transfusion is needed. And if not, then you get the rest of your day back. Because of the fatigue, um, uh, sometimes there, there can be some difficulty with uh, short-term memory. Um, and so it may be um, easier to just keep a symptom diary and you bring that to your visits. If you plan on returning to work after your transplant, um, let your employer know that you will need at least two to three months to recover, um, just so that they can anticipate when uh, it may be safe for you to return to work. And in terms of the immune system, it can take um, anywhere between three and 12 months to fully recover. Uh, that just depends on the individual. Okay, uh, Dr. Wong, next slide, please. 
when identifying uh, a caregiver, um, these are the things that your caregiver um, will be doing. Um, so like I mentioned before, driving to and from the clinic and uh, helping prepare the house um, for your return home. And then also to maintain uh, a, a clean home when you do return home, uh, to make those grocery runs so that you can maintain social distancing, uh, to help prepare meals when you're feeling too tired. Um, and it is important to you know, eat fresh meals rather than um, takeout or leftovers. And then if you have any pets that um, they should be the ones to clean up the feces, uh, to um, clean the litter box. And before the transplant, uh, it would be good to make sure your pet's health is um, um, addressed in terms of them being fully immunized, um, that uh, if they need any uh, vaccines or anything like that, um, or checks for parasites and infections, that it's all done before um, you return home. And then the caregiver can also help with medications if needed. And next slide, please. In terms of visitors, uh, so this is um, after returning home, it, it's uh, probably a good idea to limit visitors to small groups. So for, like, for example, two people at a time, screen visitors for any infection symptoms and um, kindly ask them to reschedule if they had a recent infection or cold or um, uh, if they were recently exposed to any of those live viruses that are quite contagious like shingles or chicken pox, um, or if they had a live vaccine, um, that could be risky to you. And, and when they do come to visit, you know, ask them, can you please wash your hands? Um, can you please wear a mask? And then you do the same as well. And if you have been exposed to any of those uh, viruses we've discussed, including COVID, um, and in addition, such as measles or rubella, please uh, notify your transplant team and then they can guide you in terms of um, what to do next. Um, and next slide, please. Sexual health is a topic um, that really doesn't get covered enough, um, but it is an important part of life. And, and so I uh, wanted to just go over this. Um, sexual desire, libido can temporarily change uh, in the post-transplant setting or um, due to chemo. Uh, do talk to your provider if there is prolonged sexual dysfunction or a lack of desire. Have an open dialogue with uh, your partner um, and continue that communication. There are other ways to um, be intimate, such as hugging, kissing, cuddling, and um, do avoid vaginal, oral, or anal sex when platelets are less than 50,000 due to bleeding risk. Uh, or when absolute neutrophils are below a thousand due to infection risk. Um, avoid sexual activity if um, your partner has a genital infection. Avoid sexual activity uh, that can expose uh, mucous membranes to uh, fecal matter. And then uh, it's important to use double contraception to prevent pregnancy. If you do desire to get pregnant in the future, um, consider talking to your transplant team um, and consider a reproductive health uh, referral. For women, uh, menstrual cycle changes can be expected um, and also vaginal discomfort or dryness. And there are some solutions to that. Um, so uh, have a discussion with your transplant doctor. And then for men, uh, erectile, erectile dysfunction can happen and there are also medications um, to help with that. Next slide, please. And lastly, in terms of long-term survivorship, uh, post-transplant, um, there will be a, a repeat bone marrow biopsy. And then after that, your transplant doctor may discuss um, the importance of maintenance therapy if it's indicated. And this is really to maintain um, the progress of the stem cell transplant and sometimes to further deepen the response. Um, at most centers, uh, post-transplant vaccines will be recommended, but in terms of the specific vaccine, um, that will be uh, specific to your transplant center. Uh, so at UCSF, uh, we give 
um, so we call these pediatric vaccines because oftentimes these are um, vaccines that um, children get at, a, at an early age. So you would get revaccinated. Um, so at UCSF, um, vaccines like hepatitis B, Haemophilus influenza, polio, um, tetanus, uh, pneumonia. And then also consider um, the inactivated form of the shingles vaccine um, called Shingrix. And of course, yearly flu shot. And then um, at our center, we do revaccinate with the COVID vaccine series. Regular lab checks um, should occur, including um, amyloidosis labs. Um, if there's cardiac involvement, cardiac biomarkers, um, urine protein. And then, like I said, um, uh, bone marrow biopsies may be recommended on a yearly basis um, and imaging if necessary. And other um, healthcare maintenance uh, things to take care of, um, this is the time when you're in that maintenance phase, it's important to keep up with these um, uh, yearly exams such as, or not yearly, but um, these types of exams, uh, like a colonoscopy, mammograms, a DEXA bone scan, and yearly skin checks. Um, and this is a very important time to address you know, quality of life issues. Um, so let your care team know if uh, the maintenance therapy, um, there, if there's just too many side effects um, and uh, we can adjust things accordingly. Um, and I think that that is all I have. Um, I think the next slide would be for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was a wonderful presentation. I have a few questions to ask um, either of you. Uh, thank you for those who uh, participated in the Q&A. This question, uh, first and foremost, is from Francine. Francine asks, with the improved outcomes of AL amyloidosis with daratumumab treatment, have the indications for stem cell transplant changed? Yeah, so I can take that question. I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, in, back in, before uh, Zara Cyber-D, we used to give patients Cyber-D, and then if they're transplant eligible, prep them for a transplant as soon as possible. And some transplant centers, if they're able to, may even skip the Cyber-D part and just bring the patients straight to a stem cell transplant. This was obviously in patients who uh, were transplant eligible. That has very much changed nowadays with the Dara Cyber D because, as I have shown you on my slides, Dara, Dara Cyber D induces a very high VGPR better rate. And in terms of an organ response rate, it's around 60%. And so, as a result, it is now um, unclear to us for a stem cell transplant eligible patient. Should they get their cyber D and if they have an insufficient response, I think that is definitely something that needs to be considered a stem cell transplant, right? If patients who are, are only in a, a partial response, you know, and don't have the translocation 1114, I think those patients absolutely need to move on to a stem cell transplant. But then uh, apart, apart from that, that's where the gray area is, you know, so for, so for someone who is in CR, a complete hematologic response, should those patients move on to a stem cell transplant? It's unclear, you know, because then you're, you know, the whole point is shut down the factory. Well, the factory has completely shut down, it looks like. So, so would those patients really benefit from a stem cell transplant? And we had just talked about stem cell transplant is not a walk in the park, right? There is a, some real side effects. There is a transplant related uh, mortality as well that we have to contend with. Um, so that's, I think, where the gray area is. And that's why there are trials being put together um, by one of the cooperative groups to answer these questions. So I think we will have answers to these questions in the next you know, five years. But in the meantime, what do we do? And I think that is where the art of medicine comes in. And that's why I encourage all of you to speak to your amyloidosis doctor to see what is right for you. Dr. Wong, fantastic answer. Thank you so much. The next question is uh, still on the lines of stem cells. The question is from David. David asks, Blood cell transplant, excuse me, blood cell, blood stem cells are ideally from patients, correct? Now, are there cases within your or Nancy's experience when a donator or a donor, excuse me, is uh, comes from an identical twin? 
Um, again, the ideal is from the patient themselves. But has there been cases where a donor, such as an identical twin, uh, has been appropriate? And if so, how is that decision determined? Um, so what this patient is, uh, this person is referring to is called a syngeneic stem cell, autologous stem cell, uh, syngeneic stem cell transfer, minus the autologous, it's not your own cells. <laughs> um, so actually, um, in AL amyloidosis, that actually, you know, has not really been reported in any sort of large series, because that is not common, obviously, to have a twin that's identical. Um, but that has been reported in myeloma, our sister disease, um, in myeloma patients. And uh, in my six years here at UCSF, I've seen one syngeneic stem cell transplant for myeloma. It's a, in our whole you know, group. It's, it's very uncommon to, to do those types of uh, stem cell transplants. So there's a few considerations um, in the literature that we can refer to. You know, the first question that usually the patient asks me is, hey, if I have a twin, can I use their stem cells? And maybe like, you know, one is it more likely to cure me of this disease, because right now AL amyloidosis generally is thought as not a curable disease. And then the second question is like, can I then bypass the issues with like um, uh, the side effects of getting the stem cells out for me? Those are usually the two questions I, I, I have heard about, at least that particular patient had, had asked me. Um, and, uh, and so in terms of the first question about curability, I think there are reports in the myeloma literature, these are old reports that it does not seem, at least in all sister disease, a sister disease to be a way to cure patients, number one. Um, granted, these are just small, like, you know, case reports and things like that. And then the second uh, question about, you know, bypassing the issues with, um, with uh, uh, you know, getting the, bypassing the side effects of actually collection. Well, <laughs> you trade that in, unfortunately, for other potential side effects. So even though um, the infused stem cells is from a identical twin, their immune system is not completely the same as your immune system and your tissues. And so even, genet even though genetically is the same, and that's because as we go on with life, our immune system is really trained to the pathogens we encounter and to our body. And so, you know, um, so you trade those side effects in, in terms of getting collected to, you know, uh, potentially more risk when it comes to more side effects when the stem cells get uh, put back in because there are is something called uh, 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 post transplant engraftment syndrome where essentially and this can even happen with your your own stem cells but it's really uncommon but may, maybe higher with stem cells from other, other people um, definitely with allogeneic stem cells where you have like you know this inflammatory disorder that that comes about so you try to create one problem for another problem and we generally like the problems that we know well best how to manage. And so that's why, generally speaking, we, we do not uh, use syngeneic stem cell transplants for AL. Um, in myeloma, there are situations if the one is present where we would, um, but that's for, for myeloma patients. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> I think Lauren, you're frozen. Lauren, I think you're frozen. I guess my very long answer caused this great <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see the the question. Yeah, we can. We can, we can. Yeah, we can move on to some of the other questions. I, I can take a simple one here. Yeah, I think see. someone says, "How? Um, when oh. is it safe to for for pets?" Yeah. To see your, yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you want to read the and, question? Yeah, it says, uh, this is from uh, Lesia. Uh, after discharge from the hospital, uh, after the transplant, when is it safe to see my dog? And, and pretty much it's it's safe to see pets. Um, just make sure there's cleanliness and don't, um, you know, uh, deal with the, the feces um, and minimize any kissing or um, anything that introduces potential bacteria into your mouth or, um, or mucous membranes. And then uh, Dr. Wan, do you wanna take, I don't know, can you read the question? Can you see the question and see which one you wanna? Oh, I think, um, yeah. Gregory, do you wanna take over? Yeah, <laughs> well, Nancy and Dr. Wan, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, for all of our attendees who did drop questions in the Q&A box, we will be following up with you to provide 
direct responses to your questions. Thank you all so much for your time today. It was an awesome presentation. And please take a few minutes to fill out the survey um, at the close of the webinar. It'll pop right up on your browser for you. And thank you all for attending and hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.